Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be with you today. That was the nicest video. You know, thank you so much. You, you can be seated. Thank you. You're so kind. That was the nicest video because normally the intro is, here's the cancer survivor. Here's the dude who has a list. And ladies and gentlemen, he barely is alive. It's Jason. I'm like, thank you. Um, normally everywhere I go, I'm the cancer guy. So that was really refreshing to not be the cancer guy. Um, because for those who don't know, I, I lost 80% of my tongue to stage four cancer. I was told I would never speak or sing again. My wife was told to prepare for a funeral. And, um, and now I'm here with you, which is crazy. And, um, you know, I, I, do, I do sound like Sid the Sloth from Ice Age. Uh, in case you're wondering, I wasn't born sounding like Sid the Sloth. And I am not, I have been asked many times, I am not the voice of Sid the Sloth. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is who I am now. You know, this is the post, post cancer, but I'm alive. But I, I came to let you know, because normally, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the cancer guy. And uh, I have to remind people that, you know, I, I, I've survived more than just cancer. Uh, because, like, one time I was bitten by a seagull. And um, another time I was sprayed by a skunk. And uh, I've been chased by a beaver. I've been ambushed by a possum. I've been uh, tackled by a Rottweiler and been stung by a bee. So I'm, I'm a survivor and uh, I'm not just cancer. So no one ever introduces me as the bee sting survivor. It's always like the cancer guy. Uh, but you know, animals don't like me. Um, and I'm gonna prove that point. Uh, I came to share some stories with you that aren't just about cancer. So, um, uh, tonight, I'm going to share some more animals that have attacked me. <laughs> but right now, I want to tell you about one specific one that, that really, really made me think I was actually going to die. Like this one, I really thought, was, this is before cancer tried to kill me. This next animal almost did it first. Um, my wife and I are from San Diego, California. So I'm going to take you with me to the beaches of San Diego, California. I mean, that's not technically San Diego. That's, that's CGI. But just pretend that we're in San Diego. All right, and in, in San Diego, you have the breeze and the seagulls and the waves, and it's just love. And I was trying to impress my wife. We were newly married, and I really wanted to impress her. So I rented a longboard. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a longboard is a giant surfboard for people who are not athletic. So in case you're wondering, it's just a giant surfboard to not surf on. So we took the longboard. And I said, hey, hey, lovey, let's, let's take this, let's go out into the ocean. She was a little nervous, and I was like, good, you know, she's gonna have to like, you know, really like see how brave I am, you know? So we get this longboard, and I want you to know that we took this longboard past the waves. That's very important that you know that. We were going past all the waves. She got nervous, so she's like, Jason, I'm scared of sharks. I was like, don't worry. They're all locked up at SeaWorld, no parole. We're good. There's no sharks here. So we are sitting on the songboard. Our feet are dangling in the water. All of a sudden, she starts shaking. She points down at her feet and she screams, SHARK! And I thought she was joking. I was like, that's, that's funny, babe. Then I looked down at my feet. Now here's the thing. If you ever see a dolphin, they move like this. Right? You know what I'm talking about? A shark doesn't move like that. A shark moves like this. And this thing, I looked down at my feet, shadowy figure, he wasn't doing this. He was doing this. I was like, that's a shark. So as manly as I could, I lifted my feet out of the water and just sat down still pretending to be a man and then the shark went away I was like we're good we're good we're good we're good that was weird but we're good not even five minutes later he comes back with two other sharks three sharks are surrounding our longboard at this point I gotta be real my heart starts pounding more so because my wife 
is shaking, screaming, and I'm like, we're going to tip over because of her. She is shaking so bad. I'm trying to balance the board. We're gonna die, and it's really gonna be her fault if we can be real, because she's not trusting God right now. So I, so I thought I gotta say something. I gotta say something that will calm her down. So I said, babe, don't worry. God is with us. I didn't mean it. I, I didn't mean, I don't know if God was there ever in the ocean. Does he care? I don't know. I was, I didn't mean it, but I knew if I said it, she would be like, you're right. So I sounded like a man of faith, but if I can be real, I was just a man of words in that moment. And uh, I said what I needed to say, but here's the craziest thing, you guys. As soon as I said that, remember, we were past all the waves. As soon as I said those words, a wave formed out of nowhere. And it sounded like, like a rushing wind, like, like a loud. And this wave came out of nowhere. It picked up our board, and we start flying into the shore. Now, this is San Diego where there's like too many people, right? So there's people, like all these kids everywhere in the water. And I did not try not to hit them. <laughs> I'm just holding on to the longboard. And in this moment, I'm just trying not to fall into the water. And somehow, we did not hit a single person. I wasn't steering. I was like, you know, if we hit someone, we'll pray for them. I don't know what to tell you. Because I just don't want to be bitten by a shark right now. We get to the shore. And we get to my backpack in the sand, and my phone is ringing, and I, I answer the phone. It's my mom. She says, Jason, David. And that means I'm in trouble because she only, David's actually my middle name. My last name is, is Slider, but it looks like Slutter, and no one wants to be called that. So, so I go by Jason, David. So she says, Jason, David, are you okay? I was like, well, we were just surrounded by three sharks. And she's like, I knew you were in danger. Five minutes ago, she was up in like Mission Viejo, or you wouldn't know where that is. She's out an hour from us, sorry. I'm like saying names of cities. Uh, she's about an hour away from us, and she uh, said, you know, five minutes ago, God dropped in my spirit that you were in danger, and I've just been praying for you, praying for you and calling you. And we, we found out that that week, a bunch of seven gill sharks had actually like swarmed that beach, and they do eat meat. I had a bunch of friends who were like, it's probably a leopard shark, they don't eat meat. Why were they hanging around my feet? Um, apparently, a longboard looks like the belly of a whale. So I learned that lesson. And uh, so I'm, I'm not just a cancer guy. I, I, I survived sharks also. But if I can be honest with you, and I hope we can kind of be honest together this morning, when I was out there and I told my wife, God is with us, I didn't feel God. I didn't feel anything but fear and panic and what it must be like to be on the Discovery Channel. That's all I felt. I did not feel a sense of peace. I didn't feel nothing but fear. And I want to ask you, what do you do when you don't feel God or see God or hear God's voice and you're in the middle of a storm or a shark attack or a diagnosis, what do you do when you don't feel God? Because I think a lot of us, we think if I don't feel God, there's something wrong with me. I must be a bad Christian no. because I go to church and, and, and I'm told like God is with me and that I should have a peace that surpasses all understanding, and that idea passes my understanding, and I am in a storm. I don't see God. I don't feel God. Oh, my goodness, I am going to hell. I must be a bad Christian because I don't feel God. And the thing is, if, if you read the Bible, I wish more Christians would do it. It's pretty cool. If, if, you, if you read the Bible, half of those characters went through moments where God felt absent to them. And they're still in the Bible. Just because you don't feel God, see God, or hear God right now does not make you a bad Christian. 
it actually might mean that God is doing something behind the scenes. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we do, I do need to clear the air. Um, uh, I hope you invite me back after I say this, but I, I do feel like God telling me I, I need to just be transparent. With it. Something my wife and I um, struggle with is that we got kicked out of Barnes & Noble. Um, and uh, Barnes & Noble is a bookstore, and we were in the kids' section playing Where's Waldo. And <laughs> have you ever played Where's Waldo? You know those books? We were... I feel better just getting off on my chest. I really felt I couldn't keep preaching unless I was honest with you. We're hoodlums. We, we got kicked out of a bookstore in the kids' section because we were Because apparently, see, I thought Barnes & Noble was like a library. You go in, you look at the book, you put it back, you leave. Apparently, guys, they want your money. And they should make that a little more clear because they put chairs and stuff as if they want you to stick around and not pay. So we got kicked out for playing. And I love Where's Waldo. If you don't know how to play Where's, Where's Waldo, here's, here's how you play it's a book. It's a cartoon. And it's got a bunch of cartoon characters all over, just like hundreds of cartoon characters. And one of them looks like that guy, right? Really fashionable. So his name is Waldo. And he wears red and white stripes. And he's somewhere hidden in that picture. And you, you look for him in the midst of a bunch of other cartoon characters who look similar to him but aren't wearing his fashionable statement. So... You try to find him, and it's called, Where is Waldo? And the publisher makes a promise to you when you buy the book. And the promise is, Waldo is there. You just have to keep looking. And I love having that promise. So I will open up the books, level one, beat it, child's play. Literally, it was for four-year-olds. Next one, level two, age five, I can do it. I'm just going through it, right? I'm almost to age 12, super pumped. I was 19 at the time, all right? I'm going through Where's Waldo? And they kicked me out before I could finish the final level. Super bumped. So I did something very dangerous. I went to the internet and I Googled Where's Waldo level whatever I was on. I found this website. It was awesome. It, was a web- it probably was not really a, a good website because what they did, someone else successfully went into Barnes & Noble. And they were able to photocopy all the Waldo books. And then they uploaded those pages to the internet for free. What? Probably not good. I probably shouldn't be telling you this right now. So I downloaded the last level. And I started looking. And can I tell you something, church? I could not find Waldo for like two weeks. Right? I'm looking. And they promised me. Right? The publisher promised me if I look hard enough, I will, Waldo is there. So I kept looking. I showed my wife. She was like, you really should grow up. I showed someone else and no one else could find it. No one could find Waldo. And then I found out something. This website likes to take photos from Waldo books and Photoshop Waldo out of the picture so people like me will spend our entire lives trying to attain the unattainable. There was no Waldo. He wasn't in that picture. And sometimes I feel like God has been photoshopped out of my life. My pastor tells me if I look hard enough, he is there. But I've been looking and praying for years and I don't see him, I don't feel him, I don't hear him. Maybe I'm on the wrong website. Maybe I'm a bad Christian. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Because I don't see God. I don't feel God. I don't hear God. What do you do when you don't feel God? When it feels like God has been photoshopped out of your life? Well, to answer that question, we need to open up the Bible. And I want to introduce you to a couple of really cool guys, Moses and his arch enemy, Pharaoh. My cow just died. What, what? Ah, get away from me. That's too far. Don't bother me. Where are these frogs coming from? It's Haley. Stop it. Stop it. There's a fire. There is a fire. 
Um, who turned off the lights? <gasps> what is happening? Yo, I could tell you. <laughs> Who are you? Now, this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute, can you even believe it? How I became known as the Fresh Prince of Egypt. The Fresh Prince of Egypt. <laughs> so, um, so that happened. Um, so... My wife, this is actually how we connected with the church. My wife and I have this video streaming platform called MyTribe.Watch, and we walk families through the Bible in chronological order. And uh, today I want to walk you through the story of Moses. Uh, not the first half, but the second half. So, so Moses is called by God to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. And there's this amazing thing that happens. We did a whole episode on it with the 10 plagues and, and God, just show, God showing Pharaoh who the real God is because Pharaoh was convinced that he was a God. So then God was like, all right, let's, let's prove it. And then God won easily 10 to zero. So, <laughs> so then Moses is with the people. They've just left slavery. They were born in slavery, by the way. That's all they've ever known was slavery. They were born in slavery. They have now left slavery, and they're headed to a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, which apparently is very attractive. It sounds sticky to me. I'm not really into that, but cool. Milk and honey, they wanted it, so they're headed there. I would have loved if it was like, we're going to Disneyland. That'd be great. That would get me leaving Egypt. But for them, milk and honey, really, really simple. Love it. So they're headed to the promised land. And all of a sudden, on their journey, having leaving their past, leaving their past of slavery and bondage and headed to a new life of freedom and milk and honey, on that way, they find themselves stuck, having come face to face with the Red Sea. I'm going to take you there. Now, I know it's blue, even though it's called Red Sea. And that's confusing, but I'm not going to explain why. So they find themselves stuck at the Red Sea. And here's the thing. They were marching forward with joy, singing Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston songs. There can't be miracles. You know, they were just like, into it is beautiful. When you believe. That's my, that's my Whitney Houston impression. Um, so they're headed. An exciting future awaits. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they find themselves stuck. Can't move forward. Can't cross the Red Sea. It's too dangerous. Have you ever been marching forward, having just had a miracle, having just left something painful behind, only to find yourself stuck to where you wanted to go? Like for me, I got diagnosed with cancer. They removed 20% of my tongue, half the lymph nodes in my neck. It was crazy. It was like a three-month battle. But then I was told, you're good, you're cancer-free, and boom, I thought I had left it, and now I was headed to a cancer-free life, and then boom, cancer comes back, stage four, if we don't operate, you're going to die, and now they got to remove another 60% of my tongue and all the lymph nodes in my neck. I thought I was done, I thought I had left my past behind, and now I have found myself stuck. For many of us, that Red Sea was COVID-19. Like... We were making progress. We were excited. 2020, I was looking forward to 2020 since I found out that 2020 means vision. I think every pastor was like, the year of 2020, we're going to do a theme called vision. Like every pastor was going to do that, right? We were all stoked. I remember, I remember back in like 2010, I was like, I can't wait for 2020. It's just so cool, those numbers. We were all stoked, right? And then 2020 was the weirdest year ever. And for many of us, we went into that year with a promised land. We went into that year, man, like this is the year we get debt free. This is the year I restore this marriage. This is where I, I find a girlfriend. This is, the, this is the year I get my promised land, my milk and honey. 
And then boom, COVID-19, everything comes to a pause and I'm stuck. My business was just taking off. Boom. Everything was going my way, boom. And then while Moses is stuck at the Red Sea, here comes Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Their past coming back to haunt them. They thought they would never see Pharaoh again. They thought slavery was done. They thought they were over that. And now that they find themselves stuck, here comes their past reminding them of who they used to be. They can't go forward. They can't go back. They find themselves stuck. For some of us, that's what happened to us. Like we were, our marriage was doing a little better. Communication was improving. And then boom, COVID-19. And now you are stuck 24 hours a day with that person. And here come all the arguments and all the progress you thought you made in that relationship goes out the window as if all these last five years you didn't make any progress because now you are stuck and your past, the things you thought you had conquered are coming back. You were having anxiety, but you were starting to do better with anxiety. And then boom, COVID-19 and that anxiety starts coming back. You would put the cigarettes down. You would stop popping the pills. You had gotten a little better with your alcohol consumption. And then boom, you found another reason to drink. Another reason to numb yourself from the pain. And everything you thought you had left in Egypt, the slavery you thought you were free from is coming back. Have you ever been stuck between your future and your past? You can't go forward and now your past is coming back to reclaim you. Moses is stuck in this moment of my future colliding with my past, stuck in the present. And all the Israelites are not happy. So they come up to him and they're like, yo, Mo, like, what's the dealio? (laughs) I guess I'm doing a musical now. Yo, Mo, what's the dealio? Where are we gonna go? Anyway, all right, so. They come up to Moses and like, dude, did you, you didn't want us to die in Egypt. You want us to die by the beach? Like, what's going on? Like, you led us out here to die? You're a terrible leader. Do you even know what you are doing? And then Moses gives a beautiful speech, an epic speech. I like to imagine it was like, a montage of some of the most famous speeches. He, he looks at these Israelites who are complaining and crying out, and he's like, listen, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. And if that one wasn't working, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. You know, he's just like giving this great speech, or kind of like my speech to Allison when we were surrounded by sharks. Listen, do not fear. God is with us. He gives a speech to them about how they should trust God. And then he, I love this. I love, okay. He ends his speech by saying, and this is in the Bible, now everybody shut up. That's in the Bible. Don't get mad at me. It's in the Bible. He gives this epic speech and he ends it by telling everyone, shut your mouth. It's, I wish every speech in history went like that. I have a dream that y'all would just shut up, you know? Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago, shut up South, you know, like, just like every famous speech in history. Ask not what this country can do for you. In fact, stop asking and shut up, you know? Like, just like every famous speech just ends biblically the way Moses did. Just everyone stop complaining. And then in the next, this is what I love. This is what you got to read the Bible, guys. It's really cool. Okay, sometimes, you know, here's the problem. Sometimes we're like, we make the re- reading the Bible like a checklist. Right. I just gotta read it. Done, boom. Didn't really think about what I read, but 
I read it so I can tell my pastor how good I am. <laughs> but sometimes you gotta read the Bible slowly because it's saying things in between the lines. There are things that are happening because if you read it, Moses gives this epic speech. And then the next verse, God says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Wait a minute. There seems to be one sentence missing there. Because Moses just gave this amazing Braveheart speech, Independence Day speech, just like incredible speech. But then God says, why are you crying out to me? So here's what really happened. Israelites, do not fear. Has God ever failed us? Do you remember the 10 plagues? Do you remember all those frogs? We're going to be okay. You keep trusting God. Help! That's what happened. He gives a speech, and the next moment he's screaming to God, and God's like, why are you crying out to me? You just had a great speech. Why are you screaming at me? Parents, have you ever been there? You have to tell your kids, like, no, finances are good. Help! No, dad's just on the couch for a little while because he likes the couch, but God, I don't want to tell him what's really about to happen. Having to put on one face with people and a different face with God. The truth is we were wearing masks to church long before COVID mandated it. We were coming here like, dude, the devil is a liar. He's under my feet. God is good. Everything is great. God, help me. Pretending that we're okay, but when we're actually by ourselves at night, crying ourselves to sleep, being like, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Moses is putting on a brave face for his people, trying to be a great leader. But when it's just him and God, he gets real honest. He says, God, what's going on, man? And God says, why are you crying out to me? What is in your hand? And he had this really cool stick from like Middle Earth or something, like a Gandalf stick. <laughs> and God was like, Moses, I have given everything you need to move forward. I have already given you. So just move forward. And when, when you read, the, that's what God is telling him. Move forward. What's in your hand? Move forward. But God, I don't want to get wet. God, that would be very uncomfortable. God, that would be very inconvenient. God, that would actually require faith. I, I wanted to be a Christian so that I didn't have to have faith. I just want things to be easy. You're telling me I have to trust you? That's what I signed up for? Move forward. Okay, maybe I just need to pray some more. God, move forward. Yeah, okay, but I'm just going to pray in case you change your mind. Move forward. Oh, man. If you, if you don't know what to do, resort to what God told you last. And the last thing he told Moses was to move forward. And Moses is like, okay, but let me consult God some more. In case, you know, I didn't, it was the pizza talking. God, I had some weird pizza last night. Don't even know where we came from. It was Some seagulls were picking at it. And I was hungry. What do you want me to do? Move forward. Bummer. Okay. Move forward. What's in your hand? And here is where Hollywood gets it so wrong in this story. Besides Harvey Weinstein. Hollywood got a lot wrong. But <laughs> raise your hand if you have ever seen a movie production of the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea. Raise your hand. All right, maybe it was Prince of Egypt. Ah, you know, that one. Or Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, or that really weird one with Christian Bale. Like, so here's the thing when Hollywood does it, Moses comes up to the water, takes out his staff, superhero pose, boom, a massive explosion. The music gets really big. Boom, 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 water spraying everywhere. It's epic. You see silhouettes of whales, and you're like, whoa, like cra crazy stuff. Now, the danger is when you get your theology from Hollywood movies. Because that's not what happened in the Bible. 
it makes for some really cool CGI, really cool special effects. I mean, that stuff in the 1950s, that was amazing effects. I remember as a kid being like, wow, how'd they do that? And then five years later, I was like, you know, that looks kind of dated. But like, still, it was amazing. It makes for some really good movie magic, but it's not accurate. Here's what actually happened. God tells Moses, Moses, what's in your hand? Moses is like, oh yeah, Gandalf stick, awesome. Moses comes up to the water. God, we talked about this. You said, what's in my hand? You were talking about this, right? This is in my hand. You said, move forward. Okay, okay, okay. Ha <laughs> ha, it's cool, guys, it's cool. <laughs> Nothing happens. If, if you actually, do you know how awkward that would be? To... To brag about what God's about to do, and then everyone's watching, and it's like, feels like God's not doing anything. If you actually read the story, at first, nothing happened. He's just standing there, like, come on, come on, come on. Maybe I gotta, like, uh, uh, spin move. Like, nothing's happening. In fact, let's look at Exodus 14. Let's read what really happened the story that Hollywood doesn't tell you. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and and all night, all night long, all night, <laughs> all night. It didn't happen immediately. See, some of us, we, we watch those movies and we're like, God, how come in the movie, Moses prayed, boom, you healed, you, you did it immediately. I've been praying for two years. Where's my Red Sea moment? How come, how come it worked for Charleston Heston? How come it worked for a little cartoon? Where's my moment? But do you imagine how awkward it would be to stand there all night? Like, guys, I promise, he, this is what he said to do. All night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong Okay, now this is important. East wind. This is why you got to read the Bible slowly sometimes. Because a lot of people miss this. I'm going to show you why this east wind is so important. Let me, let's, let me just take you there. Let's look at the map. All right, we got Egypt. That's where they came from. You got the Red Sea. And then they were headed to the promised land. Now, Egypt was on the west side. All right, Egypt was on. That's how we say in California. West side. Egypt is on the west side. Let me go ahead and show you that. Egypt's on the west side, and the promised land is on the east side. Go ahead and show me that next map. I want to show you guys this. Oh, my goodness. That's right. They are on a route from Egypt to the promised land. That's the route, right? Now, what side is Egypt on? What side? What side? Oh, yes. Let's, let's do that again. What side are they on? What side? What's, oh, my goodness. You guys are so cool. What side? All right, they're headed to the east side. Let me show you where they are parked. Here's where they camped, right? They're right there. Well, roughly. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. But roughly, they're in that general area, headed across the Red Sea to the east side. Now, we just read a scripture verse where it says that God had what kind of wind blowing? From what direction? Let's show that. Let's look at that. The east side. Now, I am proposing to you that the Red Sea did not part at Moses' feet, but rather from the opposite side. That all night long, God was 
parting the Red Sea from the opposite side. Has God ever answered your prayer the wrong way? Like, God, I prayed for a husband, but him? You kind of answered my prayer. Kind of a big disappointment. Like, has God ever answered? Or how about this? Has he ever answered you in the wrong time? As in, not your time? He took his time, which was longer than you wanted for your time. Moses is like, watch this, guys. This is going to make for a great movie moment. Nothing happens. All night, God's working on the other side. And perhaps to the naked eye, it looked like God wasn't even doing anything. See, as far as for the Israelites, as, as far as what they can see, they don't see God. They don't hear God. They don't feel God. Right. Moses just made a fool of himself. God's not moving. And maybe some of them have to go to bed that night knowing that Egypt is approaching and God has forgotten them. Why does God do that? Like, why can't he just be like my genie who does what I want? Oh, because that would make me God. That would make him a slave to me. So why does God allow us to go through storms and it feel like he's not there? I mean, remember the disciples were in the boat with Jesus and a big storm came, a storm that was so intense that Peter and the disciples were like, we're going to die like, this wasn't like a cute storm, like, oh, lightning. It was like, we're going to die type of storm. I don't know if you've ever been in the ocean in a storm or like, those are things that are scary. The disciples thought they were going to die. Here's the thing. They were with Jesus on the boat. Because sometimes you're going through a storm and someone's like, well, you know, if you're with Jesus, it'd be better. Well, I don't know, because Peter was with Jesus and still thought he was going to die. <laughs> Jesus was in the boat. Now, he was at the bottom of the boat. And what was he doing? He was sleeping. I like to imagine he was counting sheep. He got to 99 and one was missing. That's, that's a Bible joke. But I'm to read the Bible. So, so I like to imagine Peter goes down to the boat and he wakes up Jesus. He's like, Jesus, do you, this is what they said. Do you not care that we are going to die? Because from my naked eye, you're asleep. And that is not giving me confidence right now that you care. Why? Why was Jesus asleep? Why does it sometimes feel like God is asleep when we're going through a storm? I think that story might answer it because Jesus wakes up. He goes up to the top of the boat. And he's like, peace, be still. The winds and waves obey him. And Peter and the disciples become afraid. They look at Jesus, and then they look at each other, and they say, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Like, like I've seen him raise the dead. No biggie. If I see another dead person, I'm not worried. He's raised the dead. I've seen him heal the blind, so I know he can do that. I've never seen him have the power to call Mother Nature. I didn't know that the winds and waves themselves would bow at the name of Jesus. I didn't know that. And I would not have known it had I not gone through the storm. I believe that God allows the storm so that when you go through it, you can come out of it saying, who is this? Who is this? Even the winds and the waves? Are you kidding me? I knew you could heal a headache, but cancer? Who is this? And I would not know that aspect of his character had I not gone through the storm. You're telling me that you're my friend? I know that because I went through a time where I lost my friends. You're telling me that you're my comforter? I know that because I went through a time where I was dealing with anxiety. You're my healer? I know that because I went through a time where I was sick. Is that who you are? And his answer simply is, I am. I am that I am. 
You just have to go through these different storms so you can get a better picture of who I am. Like we say, God, I want to know you more. Do you? Are you sure? Because you might have to go through some seasons to understand more deeply who he is. So we're back, we're back at the Red Sea. And Moses and the Israelites can't see God moving, but he is. He is moving behind the scenes all night long. See, just because you can't see God moving, it doesn't mean he's forgotten about you. Just because it feels like God is asleep doesn't mean that he actually is. And I know that feeling because I was diagnosed with stage four cancer and I was told I was never going to sing or speak again. For a moment there, I was stuck in a wheelchair. I might not walk again. I might not even survive. I might not live. 15-hour surgery. They removed most of my tongue. They removed all the lymph nodes in my neck. I wake up in the ICU. Haven't slept in three days. All the, the buttons are going off. I hear the beeping, the anxiety inside of me is just increasing. And I'm afraid, I'm scared. And I don't feel peace. I don't feel joy. I just feel panic and fear and confusion and anger. And I'm going through so much pain. And then, as I'm going through that pain, the doctors were trying to give me pain medicine that would help the pain. But the problem with pain medicine is, is um, it blocks you up. So your body doesn't move the way it's supposed to move. It doesn't relieve itself. And so they would give me Senna, which helps your body to function and, and, and to, to relieve itself. But in all the craziness in the ICU, one nurse ended her shift by giving me Senna, and the next nurse started her shift by giving me Senna. And I remember the most dehumanizing moment in my life. I was sitting in the hospital floor, sitting in my own waist, covered in my own blood and vomit, shaking, wanting to scream, but not able to scream because my tongue was so swollen. It was so swollen that I could not get air through my mouth. So they had put a tube, and I still have the scar, they put a trach tube in my neck but my body was rejecting that. If I may be just transparent with you, it was creating a bunch of mucus and it would clog up my neck. So I couldn't breathe through my neck. I couldn't breathe through my mouth. In my nose, they had put a feeding tube, but in all the craziness, it had kind of gotten put, pulled on and my nose started bleeding. So I couldn't breathe through my nose. Every five minutes, my body would just start convulsing. I couldn't get air. They would run in, put a tiny vacuum in my neck, get the mucus out so I could breathe. I feel like I was suffocating every five minutes and now I find myself sitting in my own waist. And the only thing my brain was telling me, it was reminding me what my doctor said. My doctor said, it will only get worse for the next five days. And I was like, five days? I can't even do this for five more minutes. The nurse came in, she cleaned me up, they put me back in the bed. I got out my phone and I typed, easy ways to die. Because I can't do this anymore. I want to kill myself. So I start looking around the hospital room, trying to find something I can kill myself with. 
But at the same time, I was tired of being poked. I was tired of the constant needles every hour. I was tired of the stitches. And so I typed easy ways to die because I want to kill myself, but I don't want to hurt myself. And I hadn't slept in three days, so I wasn't fully mentally there. I was in the darkest place I've ever been in my life. And my wife walked in, and, and, and the truth is, guys, I, I couldn't feel God. I didn't feel peace. I didn't feel joy. And people tried to cheer me up. They tried to write scripture verses and send them to me. It didn't help. I'm a pastor. I knew, I knew what, as I'm opening the letter, I knew which scripture verses they were going to quote. I'd already been quoting to them to myself. I didn't need a sermon in that moment. I didn't need a cute Christian bumper sticker. I didn't want to hear that this was part of God's plan because I hated this plan. I didn't want it. I didn't need anyone to lecture me on why I shouldn't feel the way I felt. Because unless they were also sitting in the hospital floor covered in their own waist, they don't know what it feels like to be in this moment. And some of us, we get so awkward around other people's pain, and that's understandable. It's very hard to be in the room with someone in pain. And so what we try to do is make them feel better immediately. So we quote scripture and we tell them why they shouldn't feel the way they feel. But that's actually not what Jesus did. You see, let me jump around to another Bible story real quick. Mary and Martha had a brother named Lazarus and he had died. He was a friend of Jesus and he died. You can go ahead and give me more of, of, of this amazing guy right here. He had died and Jesus shows up four days late and Mary is angry and she comes to Jesus and she's like, four days? It, I, she sent him a letter days before he died. She sent him saying, your friend Lazarus is sick. You need to come. And Jesus shows up four days after Lazarus is dead and she comes to Jesus and she says, where were you? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know what she's really saying? This is your fault. I prayed. I fasted. I tithed. I did everything the pastor told me to do. Where were you? If you had been here, my brother would still be alive. You know what Jesus did? He didn't quote scripture at her. He didn't tell her, you shouldn't feel that way. You know what he said? He said, Mary, show me the body. What is he really saying? Tell me more. Take me with you to that moment of pain because I want to feel what you are feeling right now. Take me to the moment that you signed the divorce papers. Tell me more about what that felt like. Take me with you to the hospital when you watch your grandma take her last breath. Tell me what that felt like. Show me the body. And when he got there, you know what Jesus did? The easiest memory verse in the entire Bible. Jesus wept. That verse is only two words long, but it packs so much meaning because Jesus, who was God, had just been accused of being a bad friend. He had just been accused of not caring, but he didn't defend his character. He didn't argue. He didn't quote scripture. He simply showed up and he wept. He put himself in their shoes. He had empathy. And he said, you know, this does hurt. I would be mad too. Did you know that Jesus is okay with your anger and your confusion and your pain? 
He's not mad at you. He wants to cry with you. He wants to weep with you. He wants to know what you are feeling. He wants you to tell See, some of us, we get so mad at God, so we put up a wall. We're embarrassed. We're actually embarrassed about how angry we are at God. And we think, I can't let him know, as if he doesn't know. I can't let him know how angry I am, I, I am at him. And God's like, well, I just want to hug you. I just want to sit with you and cry with you. I'm not mad at you. I would be mad with you. I hate that the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. I hate what sin has done to your planet. And let me cry with you. My wife walked into the hospital room and she saw my face, my life, my life was gone. There was no spark in my eyes, my, 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 I was just pale. I know you think I'm white now, but I was like really white. And she, she didn't know what to do. So she sat there in the silence with me and she wept with me. You know what you're doing when you do that with someone? You're letting them know that it's okay to not be okay. You see, the Bible says there is a season for laughing, but it also says there is a season for weeping. And we as Christians like to fast forward that season. We don't want the grief. We want to pretend like we're already in heaven, but we're not. It's okay to have those seasons because God is in those seasons. So my, my wife didn't know what to say. She didn't have the words to say. So when words were not enough, she began to sing. And my, my, my wife would tell you, she, she's not a singer. She doesn't sing. That's not her thing. But she just began to sing. And she didn't even know what to sing. One of our favorite hymns is Come Thou Found. Come Thou Found of every blessing. We love the melody, but she didn't even know the words to it. So she took that melody and she just made up her own words. You are good, God. You are good, God. You are good. You are good. She didn't hit all the right notes. She didn't say all the right words. But in that moment, it was beautiful. Her voice was echoing through the cold hospital walls and the floors and filling the atmosphere. And in that moment, I felt if peace was a person, it like floated into that room. And for the first time in those three days, I felt peace. She began to sing when I couldn't. She brought her faith when I was out of it. This is why we come to church. Because I might be in my weakest moment and I need you. But I don't need you to judge me. I don't need you to preach at me. I need you to sing when I can't sing. To lift your hands when I can't lift my hands. To pray when I can't pray. That's why I'm here. I didn't come to be judged. I didn't come to be perfect. I came to, let, to have someone who would say, show me the body. Tell me about the pain. And while you were on your knees crying, I will be on my feet praying. Amen. And in that moment, for the first time in three days, my eyes got heavy and I, I drifted to sleep. I woke up 15 hours later and I watched the Avengers. And I watched every MCU movie in order at that moment. And I watched NFL football because I just need to see someone hit someone. And I made a decision that day. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to kill myself. I can, be, can I be honest with you? That was the only thing I accomplished that day. And the next day when I woke up, I only got one thing done. I was stuck in that bed. I was bedridden, had a bunch of goals, but I only got one of them checked off. And it was simply this, 
I didn't give up. And the next day, I only got one thing done, but you know what it was? I didn't give up. And that's the only thing I got accomplished. And that's the only reason I am standing here right now. Some of you have been beating yourself up because you think, man, I'm not getting a bunch of stuff done. I don't feel like a good mother. I don't feel like a good husband. I don't feel like a good wife. I'm letting the dishes pile up. I'm not getting anything done. But you know what? You are here and you didn't give up. And that's the only thing you needed to get done today. I went home after a couple weeks. I went through 35 rounds of radiation, eight weeks of chemotherapy. I lost 100 pounds. I weighed less than 100. You couldn't see any muscle, it was just, just rib cage. Had a feeding tube, I couldn't talk. I could barely move, but I didn't give up. And I determined I'm gonna sing again. I went to speech therapy and I began trying to talk and sing again. It was hard. And every time I heard my voice, I would weep. I hated my voice. I hated how I sounded, but I kept trying and trying. And I'd written a song. It was a song called These Walls. And I got to the point months later where I could kind of talk. They had to use subtitles, but I could kind of sing. And I asked my pastor at the time, I said, hey, I would like to get up and I'd like to sing this song to say as a thank you to my church family for everything they, they walked through with me. So I got up and I sang the song that I'd written. It was called These Walls. They put that song on Facebook. A few days later, within the first weekend, it had 100,000 views. By the next weekend, it hit a million views. The next weekend, it had 2 million views. All of a sudden, it got picked up by CBN and, and NBC and Fox and the 700 Club. And all of a sudden, the story was going viral and 6 million views on Facebook and 300,000 views on YouTube. And all of a sudden, it was starting to go into other countries. And, and Korea was calling and Japan was calling and Australia was calling and, and Germany was calling. And they were calling our church saying, can we translate this song into our language because we want to sing it in our church. And now, on any given Sunday, the song I am singing with you is being sung in China. It's being sung in the Netherlands. It's being sung all over the world in over 25 countries and 25 different languages are singing and claiming that even when the walls are standing, I will choose to worship you. Even in my suffering, I will sing. Even in my questioning, I will believe that you are moving behind the scenes. I may not see you, I may not hear you, I may not feel you, but I know you are there because you were there for Moses. You were there for the disciples in that boat. You were there for Lazarus. I mean, you raised him from the dead. And you were there for me. Now I can look back and be like, oh yeah, God was totally there, you guys. <laughs> like God, yeah, he was there, obviously. Look, the song went viral. Like, I'm here now, like God was there. But in the moment, I couldn't tell you that. Because our moments always feel like infinity. In the moment when you're going through something, it always feels like that thing will be forever, but it's not. Storms do not last forever. Every storm comes to an end and God is moving behind the scenes. I want to sing this song with you, but I want to end by telling you one more thing. It's this, when I, when I wrote this song, I didn't know what to call it yet. Because when I write a song, I, I, I don't, I don't title it until I'm, I'm done with it. It's like when I'm working on music, my wife will tell you this, I make a lot of noise. Because I'm trying, I'm trying to find the song. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying, what is the song about? What's the melody? What's the lyrics? And so I'll be banging around on the piano, like bah, bah, these walls, bah, bah, whatever. And then all of a sudden, I get really quiet. And people who don't know me 
might think, oh, he's ran out of creative juice. He got, he got tired. He got bored. He's gonna take a nap. He ran out of ideas. He just doesn't care anymore. But my wife will tell you, if Jason gets silent, if Jason gets quiet, that means he is onto something. That means he's had a light bulb moment. He's actually at his most creative in the silence. If you hear Jason working, it's because he hasn't figured out the idea yet. But as soon as he gets quiet, it means he is creating something new, something that he is excited about. And you might misinterpret my silence for apathy, but you couldn't be more wrong. My silence is actually creativity. And some of you have been wondering, why is God being silent? And you think it's because he's forgotten you, but perhaps he is actually focused and creative and working on a miracle, something behind the scenes. His silence might just mean there's a creative miracle coming. And you gotta hold on and move forward. So let's sing together. We'll have the words on the screen so you can sing with me or you can just sit there and let the words just wash over you. This song is called These Walls. You are 
like he's moving behind the scenes you might not see him you might not feel him you might not hear him but he's there he's a creative God working on some creative miracles will you just close your eyes right where you're standing and I just want to pray over Anyone in this room who feels stuck between their past and their future, you want to move forward and you feel like you can't, and you feel abandoned by God, I want to just pray over you right now. God, I thank you for the many examples that you've placed in the Bible of Bible characters who felt like you weren't there. 
and having them as an example to know that just because we don't feel you or hear you or see you does not make us bad Christians, makes us human. But thank you for today reminding us that you are there moving behind the scenes. And I pray you would help strengthen our trust and our faith. As that desperate man said to Jesus, he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I want to believe you. I want to trust you. Help me in the areas of my heart where I haven't quite come to that trust. Build my courage and my strength to believe that you are there with me. Strengthen my faith and my hope and my trust in you. And God, I pray for anyone here in need of a miracle. We pray for you to show up and to show off, to remind us of your power and your glory and your unconditional love. We pray for healing where healing is needed. We pray for finances where finances are needed. We pray for peace where anxiety has taken over. We pray for love and forgiveness where bitterness has taken our heart and turned us against others. We pray to be constantly transformed into your image and likeness and to be an example to the world of light in the darkness. And I pray that any walls that have been standing, walls of unbelief, walls of disease, walls of bad reports, walls of doubt and anger and fear and panic, that we would sing and worship you with those walls still standing and those walls would begin to crumble at the mention of your name. Jesus, we pray and everybody declared, amen, amen. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I was told I would never sing again. And this is 18 songs for the doctors. <laughs> 18 original worship songs that I wrote, sang, and recorded since being told I would never sing again. Uh, this song included and a bunch of others that um, I hope can bless you and encourage you. My wife and I took, uh, took my story. We made a, a short book about it. And um, I go into some stuff I didn't, I didn't quite have time to mention on stage, but, um, and I threw in a bunch of jokes. And we tried to make a book that you could easily share with someone. Uh, because I don't actually like reading, to be honest with you. So I made a very small book. <laughs> <laughs> that it just packs a punch with comedy and just faith building, sharing my story and more of it, and that you can ideally hand to someone and they can just be encouraged and strengthened in their faith. And finally, I want to introduce you to my little buddy here. This is Lonnie Delama. Lonnie Delama. And uh, my wife and I, uh, we have a show called My Tribe Watch, which is how we met your church and and we walk families through the bible in chronological order and and all my sermons are on there and in fact we're filming today and it's going to be on my tribe as well and some of the students are going to be in it and but we have a new show coming with this new character named Lonnie the llama to help kids save the drama for the llama and what he's going to do is he's going to take the things jesus taught and help kids who are dealing with anxiety and anger and who don't know what to do with their emotions and walk them through it. But the crazy thing is we have schools that want Lonnie the Lama in their schools. And we're gonna bring the principles of the kingdom and Jesus into these public schools through Lonnie the Lama. So now I can only, I couldn't fit much stuff on the airplane. I tried to tell him that he's my support Lama, but um, 
So um, if you can, if you want to support our ministry, there's there's like I don't know five llamas left. I don't know, and we have some books and CDs. But if you would like to support, you can also go to our website mytribe.watch and you can support us monthly. And then you can have access to all the videos and maybe see yourself on TV. Thank you so much for having. You have been such a blessing to my wife and I. You're so kind to us. Thank you so much.